We're going to look at one more section of this crucial chapter 12. Uh, we're going to start with verse 31. Uh, it follows immediately after uh, what we just heard, where our Lord faces the moment of decision. Now my soul is troubled, what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour. No, it's for this that I came. The Father answers. And now we have Jesus going on, you see? Uh, now is the crisis, the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world is cast out or cast down. There's some variants. The one who runs this world, it's over. I run it. I've won it. I've won the whole world. Every human being, every body on this world is mine. I've won it. I've paid for them with my blood. If they will only accept me and come to me, they will have an eternal life with me. That's what he's saying. Now my soul is troubled. Now we have another now. You see? Um, now. Crisis is in. Now. The prince of this world is cast out. Uh, or cast down, depending. But anyway, uh, and I, if I be lifted up, and now we have this key word in John, right? If I be lifted up always means the cross. But it means the cross, I will be lifted up and glorified. And it's an allusion to the introduction, as I've already pointed out, to the servant song. Behold, my servant shall be exalted. The same word. The exaltation of the Son of God is the cross. Why? Because it's the most glorious manifestation of the love of God. If you will go to prayer and fix your gaze on the side of Jesus, the open side of Jesus, and let the Holy Spirit instruct you, you will see for yourself the love between the Father and the Son. There, it will take your breath away. You will see the mystery. There is where you see that act of love in which Christ died. This rhythm, this rhythm of infinity, Father and Son, caught up into the humanity so that the humanity shares in this love. And that's what's being said here, you see. Now is the judgment on this world. What's going to condemn the world is light. If there's light, there's no darkness. It doesn't have to be driven away like a little bit at a time. You walk into a dark room and turn on the light, the fight's over. It's light, not darkness. And I know that that's what it happens. I know that's what happened. Okay. So if I be lifted up from the earth, this ambiguous word, I will draw all to myself. You see? Um, pantas. All. It doesn't say all men or all women. It just says all. It's an allusion to a text uh, part of it, it in Jeremiah, but it's also drawing on this these texts earlier in John, you see, about the prophecy of passion in John is always this text. Be lifted up, be glorified, be exalted. That's the way John records our, prophet, our Lord's prophecies of his passion. So, if I be lifted up, I will draw. Why have to be lifted up? Because you see, the center of all reality is the glorified humanity of Jesus Christ. That humanity, once glorified, is the living, radiant source of life for the whole universe. But it had to be glorified. You see, when that humanity was glorified, humanity was rendered apt to receive the Holy Spirit. Even though the rest of us are not glorified, the Spirit will lead us to that glorification through our own identification with Jesus in His love, His care, His desire that the whole world be saved in His suffering and death and glorification. You see? But there had to be one 
human nature glorified. That's why it says there in Acts 2.38, And having been raised to the right hand of the Father, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Because now that humanity is glorified, it's apt to receive and be the source of the Holy Spirit. I hope I'm clear. So what he's saying here is the same thing. I will be lifted up. I will draw all to myself. The power of the Holy Spirit. If you look on me really and see, what you will see is the love I have for the Father being poured out on you now. <clears throat> and you will come to me. You will live by me. You see, that's the secret of the Eucharist as well. Huh? Because when we receive the body and blood of our Lord, we are receiving Jesus Christ eternally fixed in his humanity in the act of love in which he died. That's why he's glorious. And so he said, now, he said this signifying what kind of death he was going to die. They must have gotten a hint because the crowd answered him, we heard from the law that the Christ abides forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Now he's going to tell them. For yet a little while, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light. What does he mean? Just walk? No. Believe. Move. I'm among you. Look at me. Look at my eyes. Look at my body. Look at my love for you. Can you see it through this humanity? Well, that's the light already. Believe in it. So that when I die and am glorified, you are apt to receive the Holy Spirit. You see? Uh, walk while you have the light. So that, the, so that the darkness does not overtake you. For the one walking in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, keep believing in the light so that you become sons of light. This is all the last words that Jesus addresses to the human race are there. The next thing it says, Jesus said these things and going off, hid from them. The very last thing he says is, while you have the light, keep believing in the light so that you become sons of the light. Now, that applies to us on the other side of the radiance of the light. Having been raised to the right hand of the Father, he's poured out the Holy Spirit. Now walk in that light. You have faith? Walk in this light. Don't be misled. Don't be frightened. When the whole world starts to collapse, when the whole economic system goes, when there's chaos beyond belief, walk in the light. I've given you light. You have understanding. You have faith. You see? And uh, so, you can walk in the light. Now, uh, this is as far as I think we're going to go. I want to, well, maybe I'll take you down into the next section a bit, starting with verse 37. Having performed such signs of his before them, they did not believe in him. This is the story of the whole thing, huh? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. You see? Uh, and so, uh, we're at this point now, you see? Uh, they, he, they wouldn't believe in him. Uh, so, uh, he's warning them. Having said these things, he goes away and hides from them. It's his schedule, not theirs. He will come back. He will enter Jerusalem, as we'll see in our next session. You know, be declared the king, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah and Zephaniah, and saying, here I am, the king, riding on a donkey, not a war horse. I have greater conquering to do than a king can do with a horse and a sword. I have to throw Satan out of this world. And I'll do it by this act of love in which I die. That will fill my humanity with such life that I'll be raised again in three days, and then I can fill your humanity with such light that when you die, 
you pass right over into me and you're radiant. And one day that radiance will extend even to your body. The one who eats my blood, body and drinks my blood will live forever and I will raise him up on the last day. And so that's what we have now. You see, now we start this reflection. We're not going to finish it, but we'll begin it and pick it up next time. Having performed such signs of his before them, they did not believe in him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, as I already pointed out to you. Lord, who believed our report? That is a line from uh, Isaiah. Um, when they're, um, see, uh, and the arm of the Lord, to whom has it been revealed? That's Isaiah 53. You know, Isaiah 53 is the servant song. It's the it's the fifth gospel. It's the account of the passion. Opening it up for us to see as the vicarious suffering. And so, you see, uh, Lord, who believed our report? And the arm of the Lord, to whom has it been revealed? That's Isaiah 53.1. Perhaps what we can do in preparation for the next time is look. You know where we are. We're in this uh, song. Now, some very smart fellow saw these songs, these passages, starting already um, earlier. And then this is the fourth one. See, Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and now this one. Now, uh, so this is the English translation uh, it's hard to, you know, who would believe what we have report, heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then the text starts. Now everybody who hears this text knows what comes next. Okay. Um, you see, he grew up like a sapling before him like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom men hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. John, by giving us that Isaiah text, he starts it off, but he presumes we can finish it. And if we can't, we can look it up. You see? It's, you see? Uh, for this reason they could believe, could not believe, because as Isaiah said again in another place, you see, uh, he blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they would not see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and be turned and I healed them. Now, you can see again the preciousness of pondering the scriptures. So that when you read this text here, you see, in the arm of the Lord, to whom has it been revealed, you know right away what he's talking about. He's talking about this mighty work of God, which is so full of light and so beautiful that we despise it. We don't get it. It doesn't look like Superman. So we don't get it. Who has believed our report? You see? He grew up like a sapling, like a shoot. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. We're beginning already the mystery of the passion. 